Welcome everyone to the afternoon session. Our first speaker will be Ola Svensson from EPFL and he'll be talking about separate problems. Okay. Thank you very much. So yeah. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with Moran Feltman, who is now at the uh, Open University in Israel, and Rico Sinclusen, who is at ETH. So we, we, I will talk about secretary problems. We will try to devise an algorithm, then we'll see why it fails, and this will lead us naturally to this other problem, where we can do something very nice, I think. So that's why it's two problems. The secretary problems, we will try, and you will see what, where, what's the difficulty. And then we come to a natural other problem, which we also call online contention resolution schemes, which is similar to the offline contention resolution schemes you might have seen for submodel function maximization. Um, so, before, yeah, so before starting with our algorithms, let's, uh, you know, most of you probably know the secretary problems, but let's look at the classic secretary problem. And, and here, you know, maybe classic job problem, like all of us have been looking for jobs, okay? So you can imagine yourself. So here, what's the goal? So you know, or maybe you're Mona Lisa, you have applied for N jobs, and your goal is to select the best out of these offers with the highest possible probability. That's, so that's, the goal is to devise a strategy that makes you to accept the best possible job offer. Okay, and what do you know? Well, you know N, so you know the number of jobs you applied for. And now the rules of the game is that uh, you, you don't expect the uh, universities to like <laughs> all collide against you, so the offers should arrive in a random order, or non-offers, but you should get the decisions in a random order. <laughs> and then, then you only know the value of the offer when it arrives. Okay, the salary, the startup package, and so on. And then, a little bit strange, okay? So you have to accept or reject immediately. <laughs> that's, not, that's the rules of the game, so yeah. And you cannot change your decision. So that, that's what makes it theoretically interesting, maybe not so practical. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's the game. So here's the example. So you, they arrive in a random order. <laughs> so you get maybe T or Berlin is a seven. It's a good place, but it's the first one, so you know, reject. <laughs> so, and then you have uh, maybe Princeton, wow. Second place, uh, also, yeah. We can be, as uh, a Walmart, you're surprised they didn't even apply. <laughs> so, right. yeah, and then uh, Microsoft Research, 7.2. Well, if it's the second to last, maybe, maybe accept. So, yeah, a couple of years ago, I gave this talk at Microsoft Research. <laughs> All right, so now, now, now what's the best strategy? Microsoft Research. No, no, no. <laughs> EP, EPFL. EPFL is the best strategy. No. Seriously, Ravi, what's the best strategy? <laughs> you know this problem. Huh? I see, I see. Yeah, so all these problems, so they arrive in a random order, but we don't really know what to expect, right? So, so the natural thing to do is to split, basically, the problem into two stages. Uh, so you have a sample phase where you sample uh, what, you could, what you can expect to get. Okay, what's my status in the market? And then we have the selection phase where we use the information we see in the sample phase to make some decision. All right, so, so in the select sample phase, even before seeing whatever goes around, I will pre-reject. Okay, so before seeing whatever the value I get here, I reject. Okay, and then I just observe what is the distribution. So, in particularly in the standard secretary problem, I would recommend the best offer I got in the sample phase. And then in the selection phase, remember I'm interested in selecting the best possible offer, so it doesn't make sense to select anything below that value. So I will select the first offer that has value uh, above seven, okay? So maybe eight, except. And th this is a reasonable strategy because if you say that I sample 50% of the element, then I will succeed with probably at least one four, right? Second best is here, we probably do one half, and the best is here, we probably do one half. And if the best is here and the second best is there, I will always succeed. Okay. And if you're careful and you sample one over E and do a careful analysis, you can see that the probability of success is one over E. That's an uh, old result by Duncan in the 60s, and, and this is tight, so it's, there's not much to do. But later on we will see more general variants and then we will still have a sample phase, and then we will call the elements that is better than what we saw in the sample phase to call them improving elements. Okay? So the eight here is an improving element, and in the single sector you just 
select the first improving element. So that, that, that's solved. It's a nice problem, but it's solved. So that, but recently, there was uh, increased interest in you can generalize this, right? And I think the motivation by Climber, by Bioff, and all, that came from mechanist design, I think. OK, so you can think about this. You know, instead of only selling one good, you can sell uh, a set of goods, but you have some capacity constraints. And customers arrive randomly one by one. And, and you have to decide, should I sell to this customer at all or not on, on the spot? Okay. So, so with that motivation, if I want to sell one good to customers arriving like to my shop, you know, it's a natural thing to say that I have K, I have a capacity, I have K, K radio players in my shop. Okay, so I'm willing to sell, sell up to K guys. Uh, and that's what the ex most basic extension they studied. So what if I can choose k out of n secretaries or k out of n offers? And here, you know, we change the goal a little bit from devising a strategy that makes us to select the best possible offer to a strategy that will select as high weight as possible. So we will correspond, we will compare ourselves to the optimum weight. So if I can select two, if I can select uh, two uh, secretaries here, the optimum solution would be 18 plus 20, 30. So I would like to recover a large fraction of 30. Sorry, and, but this was not the first paper. The piece of both of them are the follow up of the paper of, I mean, Klinberg, me, and Parks. All right. So I think it's important. Exactly, this is the motivation that mentioned in that, that paper. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Please put out. I'm not an expert in the history, so point out. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Good. But uh, now, now you could guess, okay, so I generalized the problem. So I, you can say k out of n instead of 1 out of n. Does it make the problem easier or harder? What would be your gut feeling? Or your, if you think about it, <laughs> that might be better. But <laughs> no, no gut feeling. So it Easier. It's easier, right? Because if I only can select one, I better not make any mistakes. But if I can select up to k customers, sometimes I can make mistakes and sometimes not. So here, you can prove that you get one, roughly 1 minus 1 over square root of k. Okay, so when k grows, it gets easier. So this is also very well understood. But let me give you one generalization which is maybe my favorite open question that is concrete, uh, where we don't know the answer. Okay. So that's, that's this uh, kind of Netflix problem. So you are a server, maybe Netflix, and you have customers on the vertices, so that's potential clients. They, they, they give bids that they want to access uh, your streaming service, but if you accept their bid, you have to guarantee at least one unit of capacity, a path from the server of one unit to them. Okay? So maybe this guy arrives, he says, I'm willing to pay four, to have access to the server, you say, OK, let me give you access. Next guy arrives, they run a random order again. Seven, OK, let me also give access to you. Notice that I can change the path that I give to the red guy as long as I always have a one unit guaranteed for him. So it's not that I fix, he doesn't care as long as he has access to the server. OK, so I accept the blue guy. The green guy comes, well, let me reject him. The purple guy, can you see that I have no choice? Because here's a mean cut of size two and I already accepted these two guys. So the purple guy I cannot accept. I don't have a capacity in my network. Okay, it's a mean cut of size two. Per, uh, orange guy, maybe I accept. I shouldn't have done though, but because there's this guy and now again there's a cut of size three and I accept the three guys. So I cannot accept him. So here it's open to find any constant competitive algorithm. It's a pretty nice question. And competitive here, you know, it's opt offline over the expected value of your algorithm. Here the expectation is over the random order and also potentially randomness of your algorithm. I think I flipped this later on, but I think it's pretty clear. If C is greater than 1 <laughs> or below 1. You know. Okay. So that's two generalizations, the k out of n and, and this one. And, and this, this is, if you, if you know uh, your combinatorial optimization, this is a gammoid. Okay, so this is a special case of a matroid. So, so the generalization that generalizes them all is, uh, is the sector problem 
where the elements that we want to accept should form an independent set in a matroid. So the two previously I stated were the uniform matroid and the gamoid. Okay. So the hope here is that by defining this problem, you can uh, capture many settings, like the two examples I gave you. But at the same time, matroids have a lot of structure, right? Matroids capture exactly when a simple greedy algorithm works. So the hope is basically that you got some sweet spot between structure and generality to still be able to do something useful. Okay. So uh, the question is, okay, so what are matroids? So, <laughs> so if you don't know that, it's unfortunate. But <laughs> but uh, but uh, but the hope is, you know. Uh, uh, that then you can think about the spanning trees or a cyclic graph for the remaining part of the talk. Uh, so whenever I talk about matroids, think that you, we are trying to solve the maximum weight spanning trees where the edges arrive online. So my ground set will be the set of edges. And the independent set is just a subset of edges that are acyclic, so that's cyclic graphs. So you know Kruskal's algorithm is a greedy algorithm and why Kruskal works is exactly explained by the properties of a matroid. So le let me just quickly, so maybe if you don't know matroids, maybe after a couple of these talks you will know matroids. So let me just quickly, so, so matroid has two axioms, it's downward closed, so if, if I have an set, independent set and I drop some elements, then it's still independent. And the second axiom is that if I have two independent sets, and one independent set is bigger than the other, then there must be an element in the bigger one that I can add to the smaller. Okay. I think the, in a cyclic graph that's true, right? If I have a graph with fewer components than the other one, there must be an edge so that I can decrease the number of components of that one. So another famous example that could be useful to think about in this talk is the linear matroid. You just have a bunch of vectors a subset of the vectors are independent if they're linearly independent. Okay. And the reason is because towards the end of the talk I will talk about span and rank. And that exactly coincides with the standard definitions. Okay. So the span of vectors is just the linear subspace and the rank is you know, the dimension. Okay, but anyway, if you never saw this, think about the graphic matroid. So the roadmap of the talk is that I want to talk about some known results see what's known, then we'll try to devise an algorithm, we get stuck, which leads us to online contentious resolution schemes. And, and then, then, I, then based on this, we have some candidate algorithm that we are unable to analyze, which I think is a clean algorithm, but we have tried and failed. But it could be good for you. Okay, so what's known? Okay, so there's a lot of known on special cases. So don't ask me, so graphic matrix, you can get a 2E. Here it's assumed that you know the whole graph in advance. Okay. First, first of my, yeah, don't ask me to define this. <laughs> so it's a 8, 3E, K times E, K sparse linear matrix. Okay, but what you could observe here is that there is a lot of constants, okay? Ex except for this one, okay? But a lot of constants uh, for many types of matroids. And, and, and in fact, the open conjecture here is more general than I stated first in the talk. It should, there should be a constant for any matroid. Okay? And this, I should also say that they were brave because they made the conjecture before the results. So, so they, were very <laughs> they had a good intuition. If it's correct. Maybe it's wrong, the conjecture. The weight, and the weight of the elements is only revealed at the arrival. Yeah. Otherwise... Uh, yeah. Otherwise, their conjecture is true. Because otherwise you calculate an optimal solution and only accept those elements. I mean, if you, yeah, so. But actually, it's interesting because by LP duality, you can see that that conjecture is equivalent to having a distribution over the weights of the elements. If you could solve that case, you could solve the one. So if you know some distribution, but the distribution is correlated. Anyway. Well, what you said is because of the mean max? Yeah, you just write down uh, some LP and. Uh, okay, so even uh, something stronger could be true. That is that if I look at matroids, I could still get a 1 over E competitive algorithm. So we don't know if this problem is harder than a single secretary problem. Okay. 
and, and for the profit inequality, that turned out to be true. So you could generalize the standard profit inequality that was a result by Kleinberg and uh, but <laughs> yes, there. So, so they show that the profit inequality, single profit inequality, gets to one half. And if I look at the more, much more general case matter, I still get one half. But here we don't know. So what do we, do we know? So there is a clean log rank competitive algorithm. Okay. Lachish and Chagaboti, they have a square root log rank and more recent Lachish has a log log rank competitive algorithm. So these are not as simple, so, 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 so the hidden cost is very big. Okay, <laughs> two to the power two to the power thirty-two. So you need pretty big rank. So so what? <laughs> so, but uh, um, so 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 what we could do is still we have a. I, I add a quiet because it's not simple, but uh, it's a little smaller constant. Okay, which is a simpler algorithm. So actually, but uh, to be fair, those algorithms have. I think the reason why they are complicated and have a hard, large constant is. If I understand things correctly, these algorithms give you that with high probability, I will recover one over log log rank of the fraction of optimum. Whereas our algorithm only does so in the expectation. So then the hidden constant is this big, because if you want a with high probability result, you want concentration. Okay. So that, that's my intuition why, why the hidden constant is so big. All right. So, so, so let's start easy. So let's start by devising this, which I hope we will be able to do. And then we'll start to try to get down to log log and we will get into trouble. Okay, so warm up log rank competitive algorithm. And this really follows by two standard tricks. Okay, so first I hope to be able to convince you that the unweighted problem is easy. If all elements have the same weight, I just greedily accept, okay? So a greedy algorithm gives me optimal. Think about if I only have to accept k out of n sectors, they all have the same value, take the k first ones. Okay, but this works for any matroid. Okay, so unweighted problem is pretty easy. But now I can reduce the, unweight, uh, yeah, reduce the weight to the unweighted case by losing a log rank factor. Okay. Why? Well, I can just you know, do geometric groupings. I put all the elements with weight between 1 and 2 in the first bucket, between 2 and 4 in the second bucket, between rank over 2 and rank in the last bucket. Okay. So I claim that I only need log rank many buckets. Why is this? You never need to care about elements that have weight less than the maximum weight over the rank. Because the amount of such elements you could pick, the total weight of these elements would be at most the weight of the heaviest element. So here, to do this bucketing, I need to have an estimate of the highest weight element in my matroid. That's not a problem to get. No, that's simple to get by sampling. Okay, so here I use sampling. Okay. And then, after I did this bucketing, I just run the unweighted algorithm on one bucket. Because all the elements basically look the same within a factor of two. Okay, so that gives me, in expectation, opt over maybe two log rank in the, in the in expectation. So that's the log rank algorithm. The only place where I use the sampling phase is to calculate what's the weight of the heaviest element and the rank of my matrix if I don't know that up front. Okay. So this didn't use much of matroids. And in fact, you can get similar guarantees in much more general settings. Okay. So that was a nice result this year by Bernstein. So he showed a log rank, log n competitive algorithm for any down close problem. So if you have only the first axiom. Okay. So here, for example, you could have MP complete problems like independent set. But you can still get the log R. You assume that you have an oracle that can solve this problem. So it's not polynomial time, but it can be discompact. And that's pretty tight, quite tight, because they also show in the paper that in the, this general setting, you cannot do better than log N over log log N. So our goal is to do better using the matrix structure because these arguments, they basically, well, they don't use the matrix structure. Okay. okay. So let's try. So then a good starting point is to start with the algorithm that we did for the single secretary problem. And let's try to run that on a matroid and let's see what goes wrong. Okay. 
So the naive generalized, and we will do that by looking at the graphic matrix. So remember, we want to find the maximum weight a cyclic graph. Okay, so naive attempt. Okay, so first step, you sample by including each element we to one half, just as before. Well, one half instead of one over e. Then this here, the dashed line, is just uh, uh, the maximum independent set of the sample. And remember that in a single secretary problem, we only accepted, we accepted the first secretary that was better than the sample. How can we translate that to a graphic case? So when should we accept an element? So for example, two, it would never be part of a maximum weight independent set, right? Because it's spanned by higher weight elements. So two, I know I, don't should, I should not take. It's not improving. Okay? It's, this guy would never be part of a maximum weight forest. Okay. So improving if and only if not spanned by heavier edges. Okay. So I don't take that guy. Four, well, that's better than three, so let's take him. Seven, it's better than whatever spans you, so let's take him. Two, it's improving, right? Because it's the one is smaller, take him. Eleven, ooh, I should have taken him, but I can't. Okay, because my greedy algorithm selected four and seven because they were improving, and then when eleven come, I'm unhappy. Okay, but that's the simplest generalization you can do, right? You sample, you take all the improving elements. So here we will get value 13, which is, I guess, pretty good. So why does this fail? Okay, because it fails. So <laughs> it's not so easy. Okay. So we call this the hat. Uh, so you have uh, one very valuable element on the bottom, connected by this unimportant element. But you don't, of course, you don't know you have this guy. Okay. So, what, so this is a tower, infinite tower. So now what happens? You sample, the yeah, opt value is basically only this edge. So you sample, okay, so maybe this is your sample. Now you start to accept improving elements. Maybe this guy's improving, there's nothing before. This guy's improving, this guy's improving. And since the tower is so huge, before you even see this edge, if it exists, you will have accepted these, some configuration like this. So this prevents you from accepting this edge whenever it arrives. Okay? So greedy algorithm here is a problem. So this is bad. And you can make it more complicated. We, we will see, you can, we call it a recursive hat. You can hang some hats on these edges later on. Okay. So that's bad. Okay. So what goes wrong? So let's take a step back, okay? So we run with sample and then we run the greedy algorithm. Okay, so which elements can we be safe that we will pick? Okay, so here, here I only drew uh, the improving elements after the sample. I don't know them, but they are there somewhere. Okay, so which guys am I guaranteed that my algorithm will pick? Okay. No, no, no comments. So, so if I have a cycle, right, I don't know which one my algorithm will leave out. But that these elements that are not taking part of a cycle of improving elements or that are not spanned by other improving elements, those I'm sure my algorithm will pick. Any greedy algorithm that just adds improving elements will pick these guys, right? You know, okay. So that I call them good. Okay? So the goal of our algorithm is to select improving elements because opt elements are always improving. <coughs> And an improving element that does not form a cycle with other improving element is good, okay? So here, this guy is good, that's good, that's good, but the red guys are not good because they form a cycle. And our algorithm might miss out on picking one of these guys, but for sure it will pick the green elements. Okay. Yes, yeah, so algorithm will always select the good elements no matter the arrival order. Okay. And the hat, of course, has the problem that since the tower was infinite, we will always have the good guy forming a cycle with some other improving elements. So uh, profitable edge is never good. That was our problem. These guys are always good with probably one half, but this guy is never good. Okay. So this, but we still want to analyze our algorithm with respect to good elements. So we would like all elements to be good with some good probability. So good with good probability. 
And the way we want to do that is to decompose the problem into independent problems so that each element is good with constant probability. Okay? So let me see, give you an example how we do it here. Okay? So yes, the guys that form uh, these paths, they are good with probability one half. This guy is never good. We need to protect, protect him from these other improving elements, right? How do you protect things in a matroid? Uh, well, you can just induce on whatever you need to predict. Remove the other elements. So for sure, if I don't have the other elements, this guy will be good. They will not span him. And then I contract to get the other matroid. Okay? So here I contract the, this edge to get the other matroid here. Okay? <coughs> We will see why I contract. So now, this is always good. He's, uh, he's alone. There's nobody that can span him in this subproblem. These guys are still good with probably one half because they are not good only when the other guy is also improving. Okay. You're with me. There's a single guy. Okay. So now, the reason that they contract to this is that they have this, uh, uh, still this statement. Solutions. In the, I can solve this instance completely independently, but their union still forms a solution to the original matroid. Okay, so for example, if I ran this show on this problem and on this problem, I took this element and the red guys here, you can just lift it up to the original problem and it's independent. So that's why I contracted. Okay. So this was able to decompose this problem into two independent problems where we can just run the trivial algorithm and be happy. So very good. So there are, there are two problems with this. Here it worked perfectly well. But the first problem is that we don't know the distribution of uh, improving elements. Because they just arrive, right? We cannot, before seeing anything, we don't know which ones will be improving. So in matrix sector problem, we can only estimate the distribution over improving elements over 50% of random elements. So we don't get the whole distribution, we just get the distribution over 50% of the elements. And this is a problem that I don't know how to solve. Okay. So this, the current elements are not clean and they don't give what I think is the right decomposition. But the second problem is that even if you know the distribution of improving elements, why should such a decomposition always exist? Okay. That's not clear neither. Right? Why should I be able to decompose my problem so that all elements become good? So we want the decomposition so that each improving element is good with constant probability. And, and that, that's the second question to just show that this is possible brought us to what we call online contention resolution schemes. Okay. So, so I will answer this question and that, that has a clean proof. Okay. So the setting, remember that each element has a probability of being improving, x sub e. I call it active now. And it turns out that if you do the calculations, the, the vector of the probabilities is actually feasible in the matro polytope. So it's a, in the spanning tree case, it will just be a fractional spanning tree. So it's, you can decompose it into a convex uh, decomposition of spanning trees. So this is pretty nice. So it says that if I have a trivial algorithm, at least fractional it works. Okay. But the problem is that they appear uh, together. Okay. So here's an example. This guy comes with two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, one third, one third, one third, and one. So you see that this can be decomposed into two spanning trees. Now I make an assumption, which is necessary. You don't need this strong assumption, but you need some assumption. So I say that the distribution of active elements is a product distribution. So the probability that E1 appears is independent from E2 appearing and so on. That's not true for improving elements, but in this setting I will make it. Okay. But on the other hand, now I also uh, assume that elements arrive in adversarial order. Okay. This is, a, this is a not a so bad assumption, actually, because all the sector algorithms, they can have adversarial order after the sample stage. Okay. They only use the random arrival to sample, and then they can make the decisions in adversarial order. Okay. So here is an example. So this is, you can think of a priori information. So here some guy comes, 
the coin is flipped with probably one third he's active, two thirds he's not active. If he's not active, I cannot pick him. This guy comes, you flip a coin, he's active, I can pick him. This guy comes, he's active, I can I cannot pick him, I can make a decision, and so on. Okay? So I can only pick active edges, and I only see if they're active when they arrive. Okay? And my goal is to devise a strategy so that I pick each edge with good probability. Okay, so our theorem is that there is an online algorithm such that for each element, we select it with probably one fourth condition on it being active. Okay. So they exist, in particularly, uh, we show that you can decompose the matrix so that each element is good with probably one fourth. So that, that's what I will show you. Uh, so if you need some further motivation, so this is very related to contention resolution schemes, if you know that. The, but this does it online, okay? Because it's with respect to any ordering. But if you need some further motivation, so I'm not that familiar with this, but... Uh, uh, so you can think of this being selection with a priori information. So you can think of an element, an edge. You know some distribution of its values, or its bids, if you want to think about game theory. And then you put the threshold so that this element appears with probability xe. Okay. So this, this corresponds to, for example, to the profit inequalities. We get a worse constant. We get the constant 4 instead of 2. But we get a much stronger URL. We get a strong adversary. So their adversary only knows what the algorithm knows. Put in the next element. Our adversary can know everything. Because we only show that we will select elements if they're good. And there is no, nothing the adversary can do to prevent our algorithm from selecting good elements. Because, you know, they were the ones that are not spanned by anything. And, and there was also an open question if you can do an oblivious pricing mechanism. It's basically that you post prices and serve people as long as you can. Uh, and that, that uh, this answer. So you can get that with a fact, losing a factor of four. So one thing here is that you have to change the matrix structure to get this to hold. You have to do this decomposition. So that's a little bit unfortunate, but I think that's necessary. So you cannot just do post the pricing with original matrix. That's a little bit technical. And there's also some other stochastic probing applications. Okay. But most of all, I think it's a nice question. Okay. So, so let's see if we can do this. Okay. So remember, we, want to, uh, we wanted to uh, decompose our problem into independent problems so that each element is good with constant probability. So I claim that there's only one way of doing this. Then we have to analyze that it works. But there's only one algorithm that can do this. OK? OK, so the only algorithm, well, we have a matrix here with all its elements. Consider the algorithm elements that are not good. So this means that they're spanned by active elements, let's say we put the 0 0.99. I just made this for into, uh, some constant here. So I put it very high. So they're very likely that they cannot be picked because there's some other active elements that span them. So these are the problematic elements. This, is, this exactly corresponds to this guy. He's, the probability that he spanned is like 0 0.9999. Okay, so these guys we need, really need to protect. Because, you know, they are spanned by other elements. So these guys need to be protected, and we know which guys need to be protected, so that's our set S. So now we decompose it into, we look at the remaining matrix you get by inducing these elements, and the contractor matrix. I don't know how to, <laughs> that's the contractor matrix. Okay? And then you recurse. Maybe there are some other guys that still need protection, and you need to select them recursively. So that's the, if you think about it, this is the only algorithm you can devise for this problem, but we need to work, prove that it works. So in, in, a, in the generalized hat, this will correspond to, so here I have some green edges and blue edges, and on the blue edges I hang another hat. Okay? So, if you, so each element appears with probably one half, let's say. So here, for sure, we need to protect the green guy because of the blue guys, but we also need to protect the blue guys because of the red guys. Okay? So the first S we select will be that we need to protect the red and the blue. Okay? They're all very likely to be spanned. Okay? So we will need to protect them, and the red guys will go somewhere else. And then at the second step, we will need to still protect the green guy. Okay? So we will remove the blue guys, and then we, then we stop. So this will correspond to that we select the green and blue edges here to protect, and then we select the, the 
the green guy here, and then we are done. But for this to work, the only thing we need to prove is that we don't need to protect all the elements. Okay? As, because it would be problematic if the set S would be the whole set and just continue forever. It's important that we make some progress. And if we could prove that we can make progress, we are done. Okay. So, in order to prove that we make progress, what we need to prove is that not all our elements are likely to be spanned in a matroid. Okay. So we have a fractional matroid point. Each element appears with probability xe. So what we need to prove is that if that holds, not all elements are likely to be spanned. Because not all elements are spanned with probability 0 0.99. Okay. <coughs> so the set S of problematic elements is a strict subset. So why is this true? Well. Yeah, so the rank of the spanned elements, for so this is intuition, the rank of the spanned elements is at most the number of active elements. The expected number of active elements is one half times the sum of xe, which is at most rank over two. So here I use that I only take an element, I, I pretend that an element is active with only probability xe over two, so I scale it down by a factor two. Okay. So expect the number of active elements is at most rank over two, but if I only span rank over two of the matroid, there must be some elements outside that are not spanned. That's the informal ar ar argument. Okay. Let's check the math. Okay. So just let P sub E denote the probability that E is spanned by active elements. Remember, an uh, element now is scaled down to be active with probability XE over two. So now you have the sum over XE times P. Okay, so this is basically expectation of the x values of the span of the active elements. So this is the expectation of active elements, the sum of x values in the span. This is just equivalent. <laughs> but now what is the x value of the span of A? Remember that x is in the matrix polytope. So this is at most uh, the rank of the span. Okay? X was a feasible solution in matrix polytope. But what's the rank of the span of a set? Think about your vectors, right? Just taking the span of a, of a set of vectors doesn't increase the rank. So this is the rank of A. The rank of a couple of vectors is most the number of uh, vectors. And now the expected number of, number of guys, since each guy pairs with probability xe over 2, is just 1 half times the sum. Okay. But now you have PE and 1 half. Not all the PEs can be greater than 1 half. Okay. So our set is... Uh, uh, hence, not all elements can be bigger than 0. I took 0. 0.99 to make it more intuitive to get the one fourth you put p to be one half. Because okay. then you have one half that you, you scale it down with probably one half, and you have one half that is not spanned. Okay. So I'm, I. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. So we will do. So this was basically the whole proof. So this was almost a complete proof. So there's one issue. Okay. So when we contract an element, you remember the, 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 the example I did, right? So I had an edge, and then I had uh, all this, the tower, and then I contract this element. That might increase the probability for these guys to be spanned. Okay. When I contract the matrix, that might change the probabilities of the elements that I didn't contract. That's an additional difficulty, OK? So what's the solution? Well, you contract. And if you need to fix some guy, just add him to your set as iteratively. Okay. So now we have to prove something stronger. Not only that the set S that you started with is a strict subset, you need to prove that the set S you obtain by iteratively adding the new dangerous element is also a strict subset. Okay. So why should this, and then you do that, whatever you did before. Okay, so, so claim set S of problematic elements is still a strict subset. So why is that? You know, suppose you have a, the, the, the set S that you want to contract is a vector space. We have like three basis vectors. Each guy was spanned with probability 0 0.99. That you always contract him shouldn't really change the vector space, right? He was already, if you add him as a basis, what does it matter if he already spanned? Yeah. You understand? So if I have a vector space, 
if the if a basis vector is span with 0 0.999, I don't need to add him to get the same space. Then I just get the same space. So most times I just get the same space. Maybe that's a, okay. Big slack in the previous proof, contracting an element that is span with probability 0 0.99 does not really change the probability for other elements. So the, the, the proof is just that you get plus, because the probability that you need to add a basis guy is just 1 minus 0 0.99, so you get plus 0 0.01 the rank of your set. Okay. Then you do exactly the same thing. Okay, you can also assume that your sum of x is form a basis in the matroid, and then you, then you get the answer. Okay, so there are some technicalities, but not much. Okay. So uh, this last in a yeah. But the, Sorry. First, <laughs> but the first argument doesn't depend on x to be in the matrix for the Yeah, it does, right? Uh, this step here, you take but x. That, yes, but the fact that, you know, if the, uh, I, I mean, that, that's basically the first equality that you have. Yeah. That doesn't have anything to do with x being in the matrix. Yeah, right? yes. Yeah, yeah. This is the only place I use that is in the matrix top. Good. Also, if you really follow what I was doing, so far I'd never used anything about the independence of the distribution. There is only expectations. Where do I use the independence of my distribution? Because here, I have to say that the probability that you're spanned is the same probability as if you condition on being active. So if I condition on you being active, your probability to be spanned should not go up a lot. So that's the only place where we use any information about the distribution. All right, summary of results. So knowing the distribution of improving else, you can get a decomposition that gives you one over four. Quite some applications. But for the major sector problem, we can only estimate the distribution of improving else, make it more messy. OK, so what would be my candidate arguing for major sector problem? I mean, I think it works. I don't know what we try to prove it, we fail. OK, so here we decompose a matrix based on x1 to xn. What would happen if I just give you 50% of the elements, but I give you the probability of their, them being improving? And then I just decompose it based on that. So, yeah. yeah. What is x1 to xn in the matrix separately? So, this is like if you, if you have all the weights, take. Look at the probability that an element is improving, right? You can take 50% of the element, check if it's improving. There is some probability, P. Or oh, you compute, you look at the sample, then you, okay. Exactly. So you have now split it into two samples. On the first sample, you can calculate the distribution of improving elements, and then you run it on the second sample. But the, the, the cleanest question that we have tried to think about is that even in this simpler model, I give you 50% randomly of the XEs. Can you then do it? Is it a good decomposition for the remaining elements? So intuitively it should work because the guys that you need to protect, they are very not so sensitive to remove a couple of guys up here, half of them. If I remove half of that just here, this guy is still very likely to be spammed. So you would still protect him. So that's the intuition of why I think it should work. You don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if I, if I give you the weights of all the elements of the matroid, okay. now can you, you can calculate the probability of them being spanned, right? <coughs> By just checking over all possible samples, what's the probability that you are improving elements? So my sample space is which 50% of the elements did I drop? Yeah. And then the remaining yeah. is. So, yes, yeah, so you would have x is equal to the probability <laughs> over the sample, E is improving with respect to uh, S, OK? Now you cannot do that for the whole set, but you can start with just taking a random 50% of the element and then calculate these XEs based on that random sample. Then run the decomposition based on that, and then just run the algorithm. Okay. My intuition that this should work is because the elements that you need, really need to protect, they are not fragile. They are really likely to be spammed. <laughs> Asked this earlier. Yeah. So why do you think that the different elements of the ground set are being spanned or independent exactly? They are not independent. Okay. So that's 
also, so, but I still think it works because the only place where you use some independence is uh, not in this proof. It's the one the probability of being spanned should not change dramatically if I assume that you're improving. So, for example, the opt elements that they're improving is independent. Basically saying from the current joint distribution, you go to the product distribution with the same marginal. Yeah. Or you can, do, you can do the decomposition based on the distribution that is really the improving elements. Because that decomposition works. The question is if it's good for the elements. Because, yeah. That's probably, yeah. Okay, so that's a little bit vague. And as I said, we were not able to prove anything yet. But two concrete open problems that I like is can you do fractional matrix secretary problem? We don't know. So here I mean that instead of accepting or rejecting an element, just take a fraction of it. And at the end of the day, you want to recover a fractional, uh, uh, well, you want to re recover still a constant fraction of the total weight, the fractional. The fractional solution should be a constant fraction of the optimum. This should be easier. The hat, for example, is trivial. Just take each element with one half, and it's a feasible solution. But we don't know how to do this. And then, then there's the gamma I, I talked about in the beginning. OK, so thank you. Yeah. Questions? Just, can you explain why if you were able to get a fractional solution com combined with the online contention resolution, why does that not imply a deterministic solution as well? Uh, sorry? Uh, if you had a fractional solution, yeah. why oh. could you not just plug it into online contention resolution and get an integral solution? Yes, uh, good, very good question. So the reason is if we could do fractional secretary, then you could first calculate the fraction for the first one half you see, or, and then build your decomposition on that. The problem is, at the moment, we need a fractional solution for the whole space and then cut. So that exactly relates to my candidate. So we, it should be robust to removing some elements, but we are not able to prove it. Yeah. So your candidate algorithm, are you able to show log-log like, rank for this one? No. Log maybe, but <laughs> here it's all or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you.